So the difference between section 5.4 and 5.3 is there's no limits on our integrals. That makes this an indefinite integral as opposed to the last section we were working with definite integrals. Basically, this is what this is saying is it says to find the antiderivative of this. That's what you're asked to do in these types of examples. Now, in the first example, and it's a lot of work that I'm not going to do here in this last few minutes of time, what you're being asked to do is to check this, check it as true or false by differentiating. So there's a lot of work to differentiate this. You'd have to use a quotient rule and then factor it very nicely. Eventually, you should get to this. I think it does work out, but it's a lot of work. Integrating stuff like that, that's a Calc 2 problem. So we're going to push that off for a little while then. For our purposes, we're going to start out with example B. And we need to find the general indefinite integral. Basically, that's asking you to find the antiderivative. But you can't find the antiderivative starting here. Because you can't integrate a product as the product of the uh, integrals. It just doesn't work. So what we got to do instead is rewrite this. And I'll rewrite it as, well, let's see, that's going to be 4u squared plus 9u plus 24u. So that's going to be plus 33u plus 54. And that's all du. That du term, your differential, is telling you what you're integrating with respect to. I want to see that in your work. The rest of this, though, this is going back to some familiar stuff from section 4.9 of finding the antiderivative. Let's ignore the 4 here and work on the antiderivative of u squared. So, uh, um, Matt, I always kind of miss you so you're behind my screen. So, Matt, what's the antiderivative of u squared? Uh, it's, wait, oh, sorry. It's u to the u cubed over 3. Good, u cubed over 3 plus 33 times what? Um, u squared over 2. Good. And one more. And then 54u. And I lied. I said one more. And one more. Plus c. Plus c. Well done. Excellent. Excellent. And that's it. You're done. All you're asked to do is find the antiderivative. Uh, we could maybe clean this up a little bit, I guess. You could write that maybe as 4 thirds u cubed plus 33 over 2 u squared plus 54 u plus a constant. But there's not a whole lot you can do to spruce that up. So thanks, Matt. Let's take a look at example C. And I hope that after just finishing section 5.3, that you recognize the trick here to use in example C. What am I going to do there to calculate the interval? What's that? Somebody said it. It's mm -hmm. not exactly the right. I mean, you can get it by bringing the X up, but if you were just simply to write. You want to simplify it with all the. Yeah, we eventually want to simplify it. If you were just to rewrite it as 5 times square root of x plus x times x to the negative first power, it's not enough to just bring it up here like that. Because right. now you've got the integral of a product. We can't integrate the integral of a product like that. Um, so you can distribute the x to the negative first power. I guess I prefer it this way, but you're free to do it by distributing x to the negative first power, it works out the same either way. For myself, that becomes the integral of 5 over x plus x to the 1 half over x plus x over x. Please write the dx. Let's simplify this. I'm going to leave that as 5 over x plus 
x to the negative 1 half plus 1 dx. Now, some of you might struggle with that first one. And I understand that. I mean, a lot of this stuff is new. I get it. So let's rewrite that this way. I'm going to take the constant of 5 and write it out front. That's going to be 5 times the integral of 1 over x dx plus the integral of x to the negative first dx plus the integral of 1 dx. You don't have to go to the extreme like I did of writing all that out in different pieces. It depends on how good you are. But one way or another, you've got to be able to see what the antiderivative of 1 over x is. And please don't tell me it's x to the 0 divided by 0. That would be a problem. What do you differentiate to get 1 over x? ln of x. So this is going to be 5 ln of x plus antiderivative here. Pretty close. If you add 1 to this, you get x to the 1 half power divided by 1 half. Divided by 1 half is the same thing as multiplying by 2. So you get 2x to the 1 half. What's the antiderivative of, of 1? x plus your constant. So there it is. If you want to write it as 2 times the square root of x or 2x to the 1 half, it really doesn't make much difference to me. Most textbooks you'll see are going to write it like you know, 2x or 2 times the square root of x. But that's fine. Square root of x and x to the 1 half are identical. I'm sorry. So how did you get 2x again? Like you root of x and root Sure. Okay. Sure. So when you integrate x to the negative 1 half, what happens? You add 1 to the exponent, you get x to the positive 1 half divided by 1 half, right? And then dividing by a fraction is multiplying by the reciprocal. So that's where you got the, the 2 in front there from. Thank you. All right, let's take a look at example D here. So this is really cool because you guys get to revisit all your rules for differentiation except in an opposite order. So I've got the integral of the secant of x. Uh, actually, I think it's t, but I'm going to write it with an x because t's get kind of messy. Secant of x times 5 times the secant of x plus 9 times the tangent of x. dx. Well, I guess the one rule that you have to keep in mind when you're working with integrals is you've got to make them look like something you can find the antiderivative of. And I can't find the antiderivative of a product like this. I just can't. I don't know what it is. But I can distribute the secant. I can play around with this, and that would give me 5 secant squared of x plus 9 secant of x tangent of x dx. And that's at least a little better. Maybe not a lot, but a little better. I'm going to continue to work with this. I'm going to split this up using the linearity properties of the integral. And write the 5 out in front, and then secant squared of x dx plus Write the 9 out in front, secant of x, tangent of x. Did that help at all? Yeah, good. It does help. Drew? Why can't you take the antiderivative from the second line you did? Here? Yeah. You can, if you're good enough. 
It just depends on your comfort level. Um, so here, tell me, what's the antiderivative here? All right, so there'd be five times the tangent of x plus um, nine times the secant of x plus your constant. Yeah, you need that constant. That constant's going to help us out with our uh, one of our problems here today. Um, I think one of the very last things we'll do is we'll build a houseboat. Okay, but we'll save that for a little bit. Um, uh, let's try example E. E, the integral of cosine of x plus one ninth x. Dx. Now you don't have to, and you know maybe Drew's going to do this all in his head. That's great. You could, if you want to, split this up. I think after a while, most of you are going to do this without splitting it up. But you could split it up like that. Carson, what's the antiderivative of cosine of x? Sine of x. Yeah, sine of x plus one ninth. Emmanuel, what's the antiderivative of x? Oh my bad. Um, be x squared over. Yeah, x squared over two. Mhm. Mm and then what else do I need, gentlemen? Plus that constant, right? I always need that constant integration. So that's sine of x plus 1 over 18 times x squared plus a constant. Hey. Now the value of that constant is stuff that we played around with in section 4.9. It's basically going to shift the function up or down. You can actually look at the effect of different values of that if you wanted to play around with it. I think I've got a little Desmos link. I didn't, I don't think I put it in the link section, but if you click on the PDF, no, that's the wrong one. Um, how is this that different than that 4.9? How, uh, in 4.9, you didn't use the integral notation. I didn't use okay, so the integral. Um, the overall, like, it's not a lot different, but uh, uh, this next problem is going to be a little bit different. So here's here's what's going on. Depending on the value of c, you're going to get a different level curve. You know, it's going to have the same shape. You're just shifting it up and down. And you can get initial value problems that'll help you determine which curve out of a whole family of curves you want to choose. But you know, great. There are a few differences here between what we did here and what we did in section 4.9. Um, here's a couple of them. So what's different about this kind of a problem than stuff that we did in the last section? In the last section, we were finding the area between the curve and the x-axis, and we were integrating with respect to x. Here, you're going to ask to find these areas and these areas are between the function and the y-axis. So one thing that's going to be different is that you're going to be integrating with respect to y. Uh, so it says, the area of the region lies to the um, right of the y-axis and the left of the parabola. Um, let's see if we can't figure out what that region is by first writing an expression for it in terms of y. Now, if it was something like this, I would integrate the function between this point and this point and integrate that area. 
Well, you can kind of turn your head sideways and think of it that way. The difference is you're going to be integrating with respect to y, because this is going to be a function of y, not a function of x. So what's our integral going to look like? It's going to be the integral from 0 to 4, zero to four of this function, 4 minus 4y four minus y squared. dy. dy. So again, that differential means is makes an important difference here. We're integrating with respect to y, not with respect to x. So this is going back to the fundamental theorem of calculus part um, part two. I need to find an antiderivative here with respect to y. Add one to that exponent, it's going to be a two. Divide by that same exponent, I'll end up with y squared over two. Yeah, I, I'm not going to try and do it all out in one step here. Let me give you something you can kind of follow along with. Four times y squared over two minus y cubed over three between zero and four. You can simplify those. That's 2y squared minus 1 third y cubed between 0 and 4. Evaluated at the upper limit, that's going to be 2 times 4 squared minus 1 third times 4 cubed. What's going to happen when I put in a 0 in here? The lower limit. It's just going to be zero. So I'll just put a minus zero just to kind of show that I'm not ignoring that lower endpoint, but that also doesn't make a difference. So 2 times 16 is 32. So 32 minus 64 over 3. So if you don't feel like doing the arithmetic and coming up with 32 over 3 for the answer, take out your calculator. Just do it this way. 32 minus 64 divided by 3, then hit the answer to, or, yeah, answer to fraction key, and bam, 32 over 3. So, 32 over 3. And that's your answer. Nice. The second part of this pertains to this graph. Are we okay with this first function? We want to find this area here. And once again, you've got an area between a curve and a y-axis. So it's easier to write this as an integral with respect to x, as with respect to y, and find the area between the curve and the y-axis. Now there's going to be one thing that's going to be different about this problem than was different than is different than this problem. Here I had x equals some function of y. That's not the case here. I've got y is some function of x. So I've got to turn this around. I get to get x by itself. How do I get x by itself here? Solve for x, so you divide by 4 first. If you want to get rid of a square root, you'd square both sides. But if you want to get rid of a fourth root, what do you do? You can raise everything to the fourth power. So eventually what you get is y to the fourth over 256 equals x. Okay, so this can be some narrow little sliver here in the first quadrant. To actually find that area, that area is going to be the integral from here to here. We're integrating with respect to y, so your limits should be along the y-axis. From 0 to 4, the constant, constant of 256, I can write that out in front, 1 over 256 leaving behind 
y to the fourth dy. I have a question. Yes. So why are we turning x into a function of y? Because I'm finding the area between this curve and the y-axis, not between a function and the x-axis. Okay. All right. Makes sense. Thank you. Sure. Now, if you wanted to, there's another way you could do this problem. You could take and find the area of this rectangle, 1 by 4 is 4, and subtract off the area here. And that would leave you with this area. Now to find the area here, that would be the straightforward integral that we've dealt with before. The integral between zero and four, or zero and one of that function dx. And that would be a different way to get this. This is just trying to give you a little bit of flexibility of thought, showing you that you can integrate with respect to x or y, okay. depending on the need. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let me remind you, you can do that on your calculator. So, it's easiest not to draw, bother trying to plug that in in terms of y. If you hit math 9, we want the integral between 0 and 4. I'm just going to do uh, y to the 4th or x to the 4th, and then dx. Don't forget, you got to divide that by 256. Divide it by 256. And then hit the math key, answer fraction should give you four fifths. So, okay. So, kind of a small little answer, small little portion of that rectangle is this shaded area, equals four fifths. For polynomials on my exams, you can use some technology to finish this stuff off. But if it's other stuff, you're going to have to do some work here. And I think this is going to be my second to last example. So let me help you out with the work here. This is the integral from 0 to pi over 4 of 3 over cosine squared of theta plus 7 of cosine squared of theta over cosine squared of theta d theta. So, at least initially, it doesn't look like it's gotten any better. Um, but actually, it has. It has gotten a little bit better. Why? All right, this is going to be just a plus 7, right? Yeah, and the cosine squared is really secant. And that's 3 over cosine squared or 3 secant squared. We like secant squared. Why do we like secant squared? Antiderivative is tangent. So this is going to be 3 times tangent of theta plus, what's the antiderivative of this? No, not 7x. 7 theta. 7 theta. That's why it's important to write this variable here. Because if I was integrating with respect to x, I'd get 7x. But I'm integrating with respect to theta. I don't need the plus c here. Why not? Subtract out. It would subtract out if I put it in, so I'll, I won't bother with that. This is going to be 3 times the tangent of pi over 4 plus 7 times pi over 4 minus... The lower limit is 0. Plugging that into both functions is going to give you 0. So it's going to be 3 times tangent of pi over 4 is 1. So 3 times 1 plus 7 pi over 4. That's your final answer for this problem. Be careful. Are you asked for a decimal approximation? No. Then it's going to be looking for an exact answer. Now, when you do this on your graphing calculator, it's only going to be able to give you a decimal answer. If you hit answer to fraction endlessly, it's not going to be able to turn that into fraction. That's because pi is not a rational number. So you're not going to figure out what that is. Um, but 
I'll typically look for exact answers. You can check your answers and say, all right, well, does my answer numerically look like 3 plus 7 pi over 4? If it does, great. If it doesn't, oh well. Let me leave you with a happy thought. All right, a lot of us, it's summertime. We're going to be out on a boat someplace. So last thing we're going to do is we're going to build a host boat. Yay. And it's good that we did an example like this. So we're integrating with respect to different variables. And here's how I'm going to construct my houseboat. I'm going to do it with calculus. I'm going to integrate the function 1 over cabin d cabin. Now, if you think about this a little bit, maybe you remember just a little bit ago, integrating something. I want to add 1 over x dx and integrate to ln of x. So in a similar way, this is going to integrate with the log. So this is going to be the log of a cabin, right? But let's not forget that we need our constant of integration. Now taking a, a wider view of what we've got, we've got a log cabin plus the C. A log cabin on the C. Oh, there's your houseboat. Yay! <laughs> All right, come on. I had to wait an entire semester for that one. You know, it takes a lot of setup. Come on, give me some love on that one. All right. Have a good one and see ya!